Okay, I think we'll give it a crack now. So, thank you very much for joining us today. Today's webinar is to introduce everybody to Research Source. My name is Doc Kelly and I'm a product specialist in the outreach team at Adam Matthew. And I have with me today three of the editors who have all worked on Research Source and who are the absolute best people to discuss it. They're all able to stick around for the whole of the webinar as well, so please feel free to ask any questions if you have them. Quick bit of housekeeping uh, ahead of all the content. We are going to be recording this webinar and you are all muted at the moment, but you can obviously use the GoToWebinar question function to ask any questions that you might have as we go along. But because we're recording, if anybody has any really bad technical issues, if your Wi-Fi drops out, if your sound cuts off, you should be able to pick it all up in the recording in a couple of days' time. We'll be keeping an eye on questions. If you have anything technical that you think we might be able to solve, give us a shout and we'll see what we can do. Uh, and I will go through all of the questions towards the end. We'll try and reserve a good amount of time just for questions. So I'll introduce you to uh, today's speakers and I'll give you a little bit of background about Research Source and how these uh, collections came about before I hand over to uh, Matt, Nick and Matt just to take us through all of the sites and the content in a lot more detail. So with me on today's webinar, I have Matt Brazier. Matt has been at Adam Matthew for about three years now. He's a development editor in our editorial team. And while he's worked on many different things in his time here, his absolute favorite one to work on so far has been America in World War II, oral histories and personal accounts. Matt's gonna to talk to you a little bit about the core subject areas in Research Source and some of the key themes that run through those collections. Following on from Matt, we have Nick Jackson. Nick is an editor in our production team, and he's, uh, he was recently the lead on the publication of our new collection, Mass Observation Project, 1980s. Nick has actually worked at Adam Matthew for 12 years, and his favorite collection to work on so far has been London Low Life. Nick's gonna to talk to you a little bit about the nature of the content in Research Source. And then finally, last but by no means least, we have Matt Brand, who is an assistant editor in our production team. Matt's been at Adam Matthew for about four years and has worked really extensively on Research Source over the last wee while. He's written some really great blog posts uh, for highlights from the collections. I would highly recommend everybody check those out after the webinar. And he's gonna go through some of those highlights for us today. Now, before I pass on to Matt Brazier, I did just wanna to touch on Research Source. This collection is over 8 million pages of content from Adam Matthews' back catalogue. It covers a huge range of topics from the Renaissance literature to 20th century global politics and business. These sources are all drawn from world leading archives, libraries and institutions, but the platform that we've created to house them is specifically designed to meet the research needs of scholars and postgraduate students so that they can digitally access all these pages of crucial content from all over the world. So without further ado, I think what I will do is just have a little look at the research source site itself, which we have here. And then Matt Brasher, if you'd like to talk us through it. Thanks very much, Dot. Um, so as Dot mentioned, my name is Matt Brasher. I'm a development editor at Adam Matthew Digital, uh, and I worked on research source during the editorial development stage of the project. So today I wanted to talk briefly about what led our editorial team to undertake the development of Research Source, along with an insight into different modules and key themes. So to begin with our original motivations behind Research Source, as some of you may know, Adam Matthew Digital began as a scholarly publisher of original manuscript content in microfilm format. So in the past, we created and published a number of microfilm projects covering a range of subject disciplines. However, as our microfilm supplier ceased offering reproduction services due to a closure of their facilities, we realized that there would be a wealth of primary source content that would be inevitably be lost to future researchers who didn't currently have access to the microfilm. So despite the technological redundancy of the format, the content within these collections is incredible. There's a diverse range of interesting primary source material. So our goal of Research Source was to future-proof our past microfilm collections and ensure we're still able to continue to support researchers by providing access to this crucial content. So when creating Research Source, we made the decision to digitize this content 
directly from our microfilm. First, we analysed the available and popular microfilm collections from our backlist. We noted down and removed those collections already available online and any that we considered would be more suitable for our other upcoming digital resources. This resulted in a core list of microfilm collections that we then divided and categorised into nine subject areas to avoid any crossover. And these subject areas have formed the individual modules of research source. So if we look at some of the individual modules in more detail, area studies China and Southeast Asia, India and Japan are complementary modules that feature a number of overarching key themes. These individual modules each feature fascinating collections that enable users to examine different societies by offering a, a Western perspective on foreign cultures and customs. So the varied material looks at the education, trade and economic development, diplomacy and foreign policy across each country. So in addition, Research Source also features a further eight modules, which cover independent, but also complementary core subject areas. So literary studies, medieval and early modern studies, empire studies and missionary studies focus on different subject areas and each contain a wide range of unique and fascinating material that we've been able to digitise directly from our microfilm. So literary studies features manuscripts, rare printed books and personal papers, providing unique access to rare and obscure texts from leading literary figures. Medieval and early modern studies also features a huge range of primary source content. There's a breadth of sources that researchers and students can use to study these topics, including the history of medicine and health, religion and science. So missionary studies and empire studies, similar to our area studies modules, have a global range of primary source content. Empire studies provides an array of documents on British colonial policy and government, as well as varying perspectives from within the British colonies. Missionary studies also contains a selection of collections from Africa, East and South Asia, Australia and the Pacific, providing material on Christian missions, churches and different denominations. So these modules are also interdisciplinary, supporting mythology and colonial history. Earlier this year, we released a further three modules of research source, each providing rich collections on different subject areas. World War II studies brings together a wealth of records that examine different aspects of warfare. This includes cabinet level discussions in Britain and the United States, the war in the Pacific and the post-war Allied occupation of Japan, as well as the activities of the Special Operations Executive. Women's studies also brings together a diverse range of uh, records, considering, for example, the experiences, education, upbringing, travels, and literary works of women of all backgrounds from across the world during the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Finally, business, economic, and labor history includes a range of sources from Britain and America, including a complete run of the London Stock Exchange yearbook, alongside papers considering labor movements across the globe, and periodicals covering the major technological developments of the early 20th century. So I hope by looking at the modules within Research Source, we can start to get a sense of the incredible range of content that can be utilized by researchers. So by digitizing our past microfilm collections, we've been able to ensure that the primary source content can continue to be made available for years to come in a modern digital format. And now I'll just hand you back over to Dot. Thanks, Matt. That was really interesting. So uh, following on from Matt, we will now have Nick. Nick, I'm just going to give you control over the mouse there. You should be able to use it now. OK, thank you, Dot. Uh, yes, indeed, I can. Uh, so yes, uh, my name is Nick Jackson, um, and I've been with Adam Matthew for <clears throat> a good few years now. Um, and I was editor of the first four uh, modules of Research Source to be released, so the three area studies modules and the Church Missionary Society archive. Uh, so, as Matt said, um, we've digitized about eight million pages of material in Research Source from the Adam Matthew Publications uh, back catalogue. Uh, and evidently, you, know, you can see from, from looking at this, this screen, I mean, our focus as a publisher of primary sources has always been on history, but sources for the, the study of history, but saying that does a, a disservice, I think, to the very significant amount of material we've published in other uh, four other disciplines. Um, and so, as you can see, we've divided the research source material into you know, broad modules, which are by their nature 
um, quite interdisciplinary. So I just wanted to spend a few moments uh, highlighting some of the content uh, which you wouldn't necessarily expect to bear this out. Obviously, you know, we have literary studies and missionary studies and so forth, but uh, quite a lot of the other um, modules which, which seem to have a historical focus are also quite interdisciplinary in, in nature. So I'm going to just click on Area Studies India as an example of that. Uh, okay, that wasn't what I wanted to happen, but let me just log in. Uh, there we go. Okay, so um, obviously area studies by their very nature are interdisciplinary, but um, I can give you a few highlights from this. Um, so the Collection Colonial Discourses Series 3 uh, contains uh, colonial fiction, um, some written in English and some translated from Indian languages. And there's an emphasis um, as well on, on works by, by women in this particular collection. Uh, we also have two collections of personal papers in Area Studies India. Um, there is uh, the journals of Michael Pakenham Edgeworth in India in the Age of Empire. He was a, a civil servant in British India uh, and he had wide ranging um, extracurricular interests in geography, languages and antiquities, all of which are covered in his in his journals. Um, and we also have the uh, the papers of Lord Curzon, who was Viceroy of India at the turn of the 20th century and was later UK Foreign Secretary. Um, and obviously this, this covers more high politics uh, of India and relations between um, the, the Raj and the government in London. And also there's an awful lot of um, material on the, the great game with, with Russia. Uh, and we also have uh, in this particular module uh, Indian newspaper reports. Uh, newspapers are useful for almost any discipline you care to mention. Um, these aren't newspapers themselves. These are published, uh, printed and published translations of uh, reports from Indian language newspapers, a uh, wide variety of those, uh, and also reports from uh, Indian newspapers in English, <clears throat> which were compiled and published by the Indian government, generally for their own use. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, as useful as, as newspapers themselves are. Um, so uh, the second module I want to just have a quick look at is uh, medieval and early modern studies. So I'll just take you back to the home page, and we can have a look at that. Hopefully, I won't get asked to log in again. No, good. Um, so I'm going to start off by just saying a bit about two uh, libraries of collectors that we have in this particular module. Um, so Renaissance Man is the it's it's the book the books and manuscripts of John Dee is the subtitle. Um, but that's that's actually slightly misleading. It's 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 his it's his library. It's the actual books of his library, not his not his personal papers or manuscripts. Um, and if I just have a click on that, and we can go in to see the the doc list. I mean that includes uh, works from as you can see here Albertus Magnus, Roger Bacon, Cicero, Copernicus, Euclid. Um, this is useful for researchers in disciplines from the history of the book to where Renaissance science met magic and uh, all sorts of things in between. Um, going back to the module homepage, um, we can see the uh, papers of Hans Sloan, who was one of the greatest collectors of his time, as well as being a, <clears throat> a physicist and naturalist in his own right. Uh, and this is this is manuscripts. Uh, this isn't uh, printed works. Um, and this contains again a, a litany of famous names: Paracelsus, uh, William Harvey, Engelbert Kempfer, who travelled in Japan, um, Hippocrates. Uh, it's particularly strong on the history of medicine. Um, uh, as also is uh, receipt books from the Folger Shakespeare Library. Uh, receipt meaning, of course, recipe. Um, so that's useful for if you're inter uh, interested in the history of um, food and drink, cookery, uh, but also, of course, science and medicine because people made their own cures at home from from receipt books as well as as well as uh, following food recipes. Um, we also have, uh, for those interested in theology, um, we have the uh, manuscripts of, or the collected uh, letters, tracts, sermons of John Fox. Um, uh, so uh, that's obviously very useful for the study of uh, the history, uh, religious history of the Reformation. And also um, gender studies are covered in this particular module. Um, we have uh, masculinity. Uh, which uh, contains rare books and manuals relating to uh, what makes a man um, over about uh, 250 years in the in the early modern period to up to about 1800. Um, and on the topic of gender studies, we'll just have a third and final look 
at a module uh, which is going to be women's studies. So I'll just, oh no, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing there. Let's take you back to the homepage. Uh, go down a bit. Yes. Um, so we can start off uh, just looking at two uh, two collections of life writing uh, in this module. Um, women's autobiographies, <clears throat> which consist of uh, 55 uh, writers, uh, female writers, uh, over about, well, about yeah, 150 years, you can see there, um, which is obviously uh, useful for all sorts of uh, studies in terms of interdisciplinarity. Um, we also have the uh, writing of, specifically of Stella Benson, um, who was uh, a novelist. Um, she was the wife of a colonial civil servant, uh, so she writes about colonialism and imperialism uh, from the perspective of being in Hong Kong. Um, she lived part of her life in California in a sort of bohemian kind of proto-commune, I think. Um, so again, that this this covers all sorts of uh, all sorts of disciplines. Um, uh, talking of the co colonial uh, studies, we have Colonial Discourses Series One: Women, Travel, and Empire, um, which contains 121 volumes of travel writing by 51 female writers. Um, uh, which is particularly interesting because there are many, uh, there are both first and subsequent generation settlers um, over the British Empire. So this is uh, useful for looking at uh, the imperialist and colonialist perspective. Um, and finally, we have women, morality and advice literature, um, which is focused on Hannah Moore, uh, who like Stella Benson um, was a sort of had her finger in, fingers in lots of pies. Uh, she wrote um, advice literature for, for women. Um, she wrote plays and poetry, and she was active in education, both in uh, writing about the history of education, particularly women's education. And also she was active as an, <clears throat> an educational um, reformer in terms of setting up institutions. Um, and also she was an evangelical Christian, so um, this pertains to uh, theology and religious studies um, as well. So yeah, I, I, that was just a quick whistle stop tour of um, the number of disciplines which uh, the, the collections in Research Source cover, even when you might not necessarily think they do from a first glance at the homepage. Um, and I think that's me done. So I will hand back to Dot. Perfect, thank you very much, Nick. Okay, so now we're gonna hand over to Matt Brand, who is gonna take us through some highlights Sorry, I just realised I was muted there. Um, thanks so much, Dot. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, you are. Brilliant. So, um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, there is really an embarrassment of riches in research source. It's, in fact, when I was deputed to test, um, I think it was Area Studies India, when that first came out, I thought, hmm, well, when I was a student, I was quite interested in the refugee French royal family in the 19th century. Well, I know one of them was heavily involved in India um, as an explorer. Another one was an aide-de-camp to Lord Roberts. I found it incredibly difficult to get anything about them archivally, you know, looking at archival catalogues and so on as a student. I thought, well, you know, obviously what's done is done, but I wonder if I can find anything on here. Area Studies India, quite a few quick searches, and I had all this amazing information. It's really quite a fantastic collection of really quite diverse sources. So I think I'd just like to start by just going into World War II studies. So this, I mean, I, I suppose you might say, you know, well, you know, World War II, it's all just going to be military papers. It's all going to be political stuff. This is really quite a fantastic, fantastic of sources. Um, we have the papers of special operations executives, so these aren't just all going to spying intelligence, although there is a lot of this in there. It's quite rare archive of an intelligence agency that's available um, in this degree, and there's an awful lot of information about conditions in occupied Europe, for example, um, as well as the day-to-day -day operations of a covert organization that I think just to give an idea of the coverage that's available here 
this collection covers all theatres, really all operational and political, even social elements of the Second World War. So these are the cabinet papers concerning defence and operational sector um, subjects amassed by Churchill and during the Second World War. And as you can see from the description at the top, all directions emanating from me are made in writing. I can tell you they most certainly were. And just to give you an idea, they were also fantastically indexed um, by the by the cabinet office. So we have subjects on you know, aerodromes, but you know you also see these things that oh, how does that come into the second world war? We've got material on Afghanistan, we've got material on major operations, on air raids, um, airborne troops. You know all manner of subjects, and as you can see with the little icon there, these are all fully searchable with OCR. Um, so you get all this brilliant detail, you get matters you know, to do with major operations such as Argonaut here, um, and yeah, it's really quite a fantastic collection. Um, you, know, you can you can spend ages going through this and you'll, you'll find the most amazing things. The famous correspondence between Churchill and Roosevelt, for example, is included here, but often in draft form. So you can see how conceptions about things like the Second Front, how these things are being thought about even before the letter is sent um, at the top of the Allied leadership. So that's one really cool collection. And oh, I'm afraid there's a bit of lag here. But there we are. Um, I apologize for my internet connection. Um, so um, in fact, if we, go, if we go back into World War II studies, um, I just want to give an example as well. SOE, I mean, I've already talked about how brilliant a collection this is. Um, and in fact, it's remarkable that some of them survived. There was actually a big fire, I think, towards the end of the war, which gutted much of the paperwork they held. We've got details on individual teams. We've got information on when things went possibly slightly pear-shaped, to say the least. But there are also guides to help you get into the material, which is really useful. We have abbreviations and code names, and you get to see all this detail. You know, that will allow you to get into what are sometimes quite operational documents when they're talking about just abbreviations. Um, the F escape, that sounds interesting, doesn't it? Um, and what's really good about the way these modules are arranged is that we can look for where somebody might appear over multiple collections. So if we put in the head, one of the heads of SOE, Colin Gubbins, we can search for him across the module. So we and we can select original collection, and we can see that he's also turning up in the cabinet papers. So you, know, you can you can look at an operation in quite granular detail in the SOE material, but then we can you know we can we can start to fit together you know where do these things we can have in quite quite minor de in quite great detail. Where do they come into the greater war effort? We've got you know Major General Gubbins is being mentioned in here. We've got the discussions that obviously are happening a little higher up. And you know, you, you we also have sort of either material to do with individual teams or individual agents. It, it, it's really fascinating how you can get sort of the bigger picture, but also quite a granular one as well. In fact, um, to give you an example of this, um, of where we can go from the big picture to the granular almost simultaneously, if we go into women's studies. One of another of my absolute favourite collections included here is Women's Suffrage in Politics, the papers of Sylvia Pankhurst. And we have really all these huge, vastly important campaigns she took part in. She was a great campaigner against European fascism. So we have material to do with that here. You have material to do with her family. You can see Christabel's up there, the various political organisations she's involved with, Ethiopia, she obviously is a great warrior for the Ethiopian cause. Um, there's material related to Romania. And then you get these quite interesting little aside. So we have photographs that she collected. Um, and you know, they're, they're sort of family ones. There are busts of people. There are photos from various campaigns. Um, and it, it's really fantastic how you can look into aspects of great sort of political figures, personal life, as well as her campaigns. Um, we've got 
this gentleman here hard at work. And then you know you can go back into this and you can look through her her notebooks for say when she was writing Workers Dreadnought. Um, and again, we've got introduction to her papers. We've got index and inv inventory, a list of pictures. But you can get all the detail you really need. You can go onto this page, or you can have it in a separate window when you're working through the documents. And you've got this really nice index that you can refer to and back from really as you wish. And in fact, if I just do another quick search here, and excuse my typing and lack of capitalization. Oh, sorry. We can see how she might appear in other collections in women's studies. Um, obviously, her own papers come up first, but she comes up in the women's suffrage collection. Um, so we can see how she's represented in the papers of her contemporaries, and how, in that case, she's represented the popular press. We can search for her at site level. And we can see if she turns up in any other collections. And very interestingly, she turns up in World War II studies. So you know, not only are these modules brilliant in their own right, but you can go across them and you can find all these amazing things out about these really quite extraordinary individuals in their causes. Um, I think this this might be communicated also to blah blah blah. But Emphatically, we do not want any of these people to get in touch with Sylvia Pankhurst. I think she's making some what some of what Representative John Lewis would have called good trouble there. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously not all just politics. It's not all just conflict. There are so many different themes here, as Nick has said. In fact, so business, economic, and labour history. We have some enormous collections in here. Um, Papers of David A. Morse. These have a genuinely global focus. There's a lot of stuff covering really sort of all sorts of 20th century international history. Um, he was involved in the Second World War and in um, the post-war reconstruction in Italy. Um, he then became quite senior in the International Labour Organization. He seems to have known everyone. There's correspondence with Bag Hammershield, there's correspondence with Anthony Eden. You know, corresponds with multiple American presidents and their campaigns, um, and also stuff on, say, rehabilitation of disabled people, of union affairs, employment in general across the globe. And it's genuinely as global Asia, Africa, the Americas, Europe, it's all there. And one thing that, as Matt raised about this is that we have stock exchange official yearbook so this is a vast quantity of listings for a vast quantity of organizations their finances across the globe and in fact just do a little trick here um medium search caledonian railway and yeah we can look up the stock listings for an individual company over an extended period of time. So if say, you know, we've, let's say we want, we're interested in the Caledonian Railway. I've selected it because it's a British company, but one that has institutional shareholdings all over the globe. So we can find say, the listing for the company, but it's mentioned elsewhere. You can see what shares might be held by it, um, who might hold shares in it. And we get all these brilliant details. So, so we, we've got all the new details, the immunities. We've got the directorships. You can start charting you know, judges and politicians, as we've got here, involved in the company, members of the peerage. And you can really start to, there, you know, there are so many different possibilities with this. You can just start searching for, oh, how often does somebody who holds that rank own shareholdings or how does this company's share price change over the years it's incredibly valuable data and we can we can just keep going for it and we can find the listings for another year we can find you know other companies that that company owns part of 
or may have another relationship with. So this to me is a really, really good collection because it just allows us to see so much, build up quantitative insights, really all sorts of things. Um, I thought finally just one thing, uh, yeah, a, a real, real, real highlight for me is the literary studies unit. And you know, we have, as you can see at the top, you know, early editions of Robert Browning's poetry. We have literary manuscripts, Brontes, um, of Henry David Thoreau, um, Caroline Norton, sort of great um, political writer as well as a brilliant literary figure. Um, I read a biography of her not too, biography of her not too long ago, um, which was using a lot of the, if not all of the uh, parts of her papers that are included here. Um, you know, we can look at the Henry David Thoreau collection. We've got his correspondence. We've got draft manuscripts. We've got drafts of various work. You, know, you can you can easily lose yourself in this collection, and you know there's there's a lot of search functionality. There's a lot of supporting features. So really, it, it's it's astounding really what you can do with this. And I'm afraid I will keep going on um, about how great it is. So I think it's time I sort of uh, pass back to boss, I guess. Thanks, Matt. That was really great. I can guarantee that I'm going to be stealing that Sylvia Pankhurst search uh, straight away in the next webinar that I do. That was a, a really fantastic highlight for me. Uh, I thought now what we could do is move on to any questions that people might have. Um, I will give everybody a little chance just to uh, pop those questions into the questions box. I have a couple myself. And we do have a couple in there already. Uh, the first one being, was the original microfilm done as black and white? And thus the research source renditions are the same. Thus are there color print originals without color retained? Uh, Matt Bracia or Nick, do you think you'd be able to answer that one for us? Uh, yeah, I can I can pick that up. Um, so it I I I don't think there's any uh, original color in this at all. Um, some of the microfilm, depending on who will have originally done the microfilm, some will have been Adam Matthew publications themselves. Some microfilm will have been filmed by the uh, archive which holds it. Uh, so I don't think there is a consistent uh, standard between black and white and grayscale. Uh, most obviously, um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, so. So I think no is the answer to that. There will there will be some <clears throat> some grayscale, some black and white. Probably depends on the age of the original film. I would have thought, um, but there's nothing that we've artificially sort of made into a black and white or grayscale microfilm, which originally wasn't one or the other. If that, I think that answers that question. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, I thought. Also, just because Matt Brand got a chance to talk through his favourite items within the collection, what I would do is ask uh, Matt Brasher and Nick both your favourites within the collection. But obviously, because I'm surprising you with that just now, I thought I would show everybody one of my favourite pieces within the collection, which is in uh, the Empire Studies collection, and it's the, the Empire Writes Back Part 2 here. Um, it's a really interesting little number. Uh, it focuses on the lives and experiences of African and Asian visitors to Britain during the period 1734 through to 1942. It's something I just really like to highlight because it proves the variety of voices within these sources as well. You know, there's a lot of focus on women, there's focus on different voices and representation within these collections as well, which is something that I think is really important in primary sources at the moment. Nick or Matt Brasher, do you have a particular favourite collection? Uh, sure, yeah, although um, Matt's already actually mentioned it, mine would probably be the Special Operations Executive um, in World War II studies as well. As you mentioned at the start, one of my favourite resources to have worked on so far is our American World War II project. Um, and I think as Matt, as Matt mentioned, it's not just military papers in there, it's also material on day-to-day -day operations and experiences. 
and there's such a wide range of files concerning those different occupations, um, you know, including details on teams and drop times and liaisons with other allied forces. So just such a great resource that you can just get completely lost in, just searching through and finding all this all this fascinating material. So I would definitely recommend anybody to go and search through that one. Nick, what about you? Have you got a favourite that you'd like to recommend to anybody? Um, I, 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 I do quite like The Empire Writes Back, actually. Uh, I wrote, a, I wrote a, a blog on um, a few of the writers in that who'd experienced Christmas in Britain um a couple of a uh, couple of years ago but um i think i would have to say uh area studies japan can i can i grab that a second uh, yeah i can't definitely. i can't take control apparently control uh, there, uh, there we, we go are. There we are. Now. yes um Japanese history is something about which i knew very little and still don't know an enormous amount in all honesty but um uh oh no it's not japan through western eyes i apologize it is East meets West, um, be just because this consists of such a huge variance over such a long period of time of uh, material about uh, or by Western travellers to Japan. Um, some of it isn't even in English. Um, some of it is uh, written in uh, romanizations of Japanese, which was, was something we, we took a long time to work out what that actually was. Um, and it's just yeah, it's just it's just a window onto a world which was entirely unfamiliar to uh, to the readers of these this material, um, and wasn't enormously more familiar to me. And I just I just just made enriched my mind to uh, an extent I was uh, not expecting. So yeah, it's another great one. I really like that choice, Nick. Uh, so we have had a question: What do you have to do to access this resource? Um, so that would be talking to uh, the sales manager who is associated with your organisation. If you get in contact with us at Adam Matthew, then we can point you in the right direction. We can get you to get in contact with the right person. Um, if you check out our website, there are plenty of people to email on that website as well. We've had a follow up question about the uh, original microfilm being done in black and white, which is uh, are the Soviet war posters, for example, now in black and white? Uh, I am not 100% sure which collection those are in. Are any of you guys able to watch that one? Those are, yeah, uh, yeah, those are in World War II studies. Um, they're in grayscale, but the quality on them is pretty damn good. Um, and I should actually point out this point as well, but although the text on them is in Cyrillic, um, there are extensive translations of pretty much everything that's in there. Um, so if, say, for example, I don't know, you were searching for sources which depict Mannerheim or have anything to do with Mannerheim, the Finnish president, you search for him in World War II studies and you'll get directed to a page which will list all the depictions of him in these posters, of which there are quite a few. Perfect. So. OK, so we've had a couple of questions asking uh, what we've got. Uh, planned for research source in the next couple of years and if we've got anything in the pipeline. Now um, guys please correct me if I'm wrong but I believe that the research source collection is currently finished as far as we see it and this is everything that we've digitized so far and are currently planning to digitize. Uh, as far as I'm aware, that is true. I don't know if, Matt Brasher, you have any more insight into that as someone in development, but I don't think we're planning to add anything to it at the moment. Uh, no, that's correct. So the, the collections that you see here are the ones that are available at the moment, and they're the ones that will be available in the future as well. Perfect. OK, um, well, if we don't have any more questions, then we will wish you all a very good morning or a good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and please do check out our website, both for the blogs that we've mentioned and also to get in contact with us. Thank you very much.